Here in Lecture 18b, we continue to be in the heart of the theory of abstract vector spaces. We'll start by reviewing linear independence and linear dependence from Lecture 17b, also spanning sets and the basis of a vector space, very, very key ideas. We'll look at more examples in this lecture, examples in what I call non-examples, which are examples that don't satisfy something. A theorem called the unique representation theorem, and that's related to something called coordinate vectors and coordinate systems, which gets back to our original main application of linear algebra to differential equations. We're going to start to see that now, uh, the, the, the basis for the theory at least, uh, no pun intended with the word basis. All right, so let's jump ahead to the linear algebra content. Let's review linear independence and also emphasize what linear dependence means. You've got a vector space. You've got a finite collection of vectors that you're considering in that vector space. And you're wondering, are they linearly independent or are they linearly dependent? This is the definition of linear independence. This collection of vectors is going to be a linearly independent set. If this vector equation right here, where this is the zero vector on the right-hand side, notice it's boldface, and the scalars, the x's, the weights, are unknown, if that has only the trivial solution, where all the x's are zero, then these vectors are linearly independent. Therefore, they would be linearly dependent if this vector equation had some non-trivial solution. Well, at least one of the x's would be non-zero, but still make this linear combination equal to zero. If your set contains the zero vector, it will automatically be a linearly dependent set. If, for example, v1 is the zero vector, and say the other v's are not, this will have non-trivial trivial solutions. You can make x1 be anything. And as long as the, x, the other x's are zero, the entire linear combination would be zero. So any set that contains the zero vector is automatically linearly dependent. With two vectors, v1 and v2, that are non-zero, they're going to be linearly independent if and only if they're not scaling multiples of each other. Geometrically, they don't, don't point in the same or op opposite directions. They will be linearly independent in that case. If they do point in the same direction, this is a vector, my finger is a vector, same direction or completely exact opposite directions, then they would be scalar multiples of each other and they would be linearly dependent. With three vectors sitting, okay, let's say inside three-dimensional space, if those three vectors are either all parallel or lie in the same plane to the origin when you put their tails at the origin, so they're parallel to that plane, three vectors, then they will be linearly dependent. But if when you put their tails at the origin, they do not all lie in the same plane, they will be linearly independent. Okay? That's intuition in lower dimensional situations. But this is the definition you have to use in general. And again, this is an arbitrary vector space. These v's could be functions. This could be a function space. And we'll look at an example of that shortly. If V does happen to be RM, M-dimensional Euclidean space, then when they are linearly independent, we can say the null space of the matrix A is zero, where A is a matrix consisting of these vectors as its column vectors. That's a way to check whether a set of vectors in RM is linearly independent or not. If the null space is non-trivial, if, it if it's got more than the zero vector, then these, these are going to be linearly dependent. So we'll think about that in some examples to come here. If m happens to be less than n, if the dimensions of these vectors is smaller than the number of vectors in Rm, then they will automatically be linearly dependent. There's no way, no way for it to be linearly independent in that case. A basis for a subspace of a vector space which could be the entire vector space itself, by the way, h could equal v, is a finite collection of vectors which we often denote by a cursive b, it's so pretty for basis, it's just so, so special. Finite set, p vectors in this case, I could have used n, 
that's a subset of B. It's a basis if two conditions hold, if B is a linearly independent set of vectors, and secondly, B spans H. H equals the span of B, the span of V1 through VP, meaning every vector in H is a linear combination of vectors in the basis. Those two conditions have to hold to be a basis. Spanning sub theorem says that if you've got a collection of vectors that spans a subspace, they might not be a basis, but you can keep removing vectors until you do get a basis. If none of these vectors is a linear combination of the others, or excuse me, if one of these vectors is a linear combination of the others, then removing that one vector from S still results in a spanning set for H. It's kind of redundant. You don't need it. Moreover, if you keep removing uh, vectors that are not necessary to still span H, then some subset of S is a basis for H as long as H is not the trivial subspace, just the, the zero vector. Okay? The zero vector by itself as a trivial vector space has no basis, okay? Because it doesn't have a subset of it that's linearly independent. Even zero by itself is not a linearly independent set. Examples and not examples of bases. So the examples are the ones that are bases and the not examples are the ones that are not bases. Let's just go ahead and talk about the standard basis of R3 to begin with. I could have done Rn, but good to start with R3 here because there's some special notation to emphasize that comes up in physics classes and engineering classes. This notation, I had J hat K hat. That's what they call these standard unit vectors in physics, and this collection of those three vectors does form a basis for three-dimensional space. What vectors are they? What arrows are they? Well, you do have to pick a coordinate system. A rectangular coordinate system is the traditional thing to use. And there are, there are infinitely many ways you can choose the coordinate system. But once you've made the choice, say an x-axis going this way, a y-axis perpendicular to it, to it going that way, and a z-axis perpendicular to both going straight up, then i-hat is a vector of length 1 along the i-hat, x-axis, excuse me, positive direction. J-hat is a vector of length 1 pointing in the positive J, uh, y direction, and k-hat is a vector of length 1 pointing in the positive z direction, straight up. I will also not hesitate to call those vectors e1, e2, and e3. Notice the e is boldface. It has nothing to do with the number e. And as a column vector, we write these as 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 simplest kind of basis, you might say. We, but even here, like I mentioned 30 seconds ago, we're really implicitly assuming the coordinate system is rectangular, not some sort of skewed coordinate system, when we make the association between these things and these column vectors. Okay? You can think about all this stuff purely algebraically and not try to visualize it. Of course, it's helpful to visualize it. And if you're not trying to visualize it, you could define these things to be these column vectors be a purely algebraic, symbolic thing. Visuals for these things are always dependent on the coordinate system you pick. Here's another collection. 1, 4, 7, 2, 5, 8, 3, 6, 9. I happen to know, going across, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I happen to know the answer for this. And well, these vectors are not random, as you can see. But even then, it's still surprising that this is actually a linearly dependent set. Typically, when you have three random vectors in R3, it will be a linearly independent set and will also span R3 and be a basis. This one will be a linearly dependent set, so it can't be a basis for R3. And it actually ends up not spanning either. If we added a fourth vector that was not in the same plane as these, these turn out to be in the same plane, that would be a spanning set, but it would be too big to be a basis. It would still be linearly dependent. That would be the case where m is less than n. 3 is what m is here. And if we had a fourth vector, it's not in the same plane as these. 
and would be four, it would automatically be a linearly dependent set and also not be a basis. Yeah, how do you decide? Um, you need to solve the corresponding homogeneous system and show there are non-trivial solutions if, if this truly is linearly dependent. So you want to make an augmented matrix. with zeros over here, and do row reduction. And actually we're going to see, putting the zeros over there is in a sense really not necessary because row operations don't affect those zeros anyway. Let's go ahead and use Mathematica to see the answer. I didn't pre-type this, but I think it's worth doing here. So let's see, we're going to do matrix form because we want the output as a matrix. Row reduces what does the row reduction. I'm just going to go ahead and put the coefficient matrix in here. I'm not going to bother with the column of zeros. Doing a control comma gives you an extra column. Doing a control return gives you an extra row. Col um, comma starts with C, just like column does, and return starts with R, just like row does. Row reduce that, and you get this matrix. And if I wanted to go ahead and think of it in terms of an augmented matrix, again, the zeros just stay, stay as they are. So we get 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. This corresponds to x minus z equals 0 and y plus 2z equals 0. The null space of A contains non-zero vectors. Z is free to be anything. You could write X and Y in terms of Z. In parametric vector form, in fact, the null space of the matrix, thinking of Z as a free variable, would be the set of vectors of the form Z times um, 1, negative 2, 1. X equals Z, I need to add Z to both sides, and Y equals negative 2Z, I need to subtract 2Z from both sides. As Z varies over the real numbers, and that definitely is not trivial. It's got plenty of non-zero vectors, infinitely many, in fact. And so what this means is that collection of three vectors is not linearly independent. It is linearly dependent, so it can't be a basis for R3. And it also would not span R3 as well. three vectors are not linearly independent in R3, they also won't span R3. And you could actually think about that with row operations here as well. If you had some non-zero numbers over here and you're wondering, does the corresponding linear transformation map onto the three-dimensional vector that I might have over here? The fact that we got zeros here and having possibly non-zero numbers here would give you possibly a non-zero number there, would lead to an inconsistent last equation, zero equals something non-zero. And that inconsistency would mean, that, mean there's no solution, and that would mean it would not span all of our three. It would span the plane that these lie in, and so if you happen to pick a right-hand side, right side vector that happened to be in the same plane, then the system would be consistent. <clears throat> You'd still get a zero down here. But if you're picking a random right-hand side, in all likelihood, it will not be in that same plane. <clears throat> How about this set? Could it be a basis for R3? It is a linearly independent set. Two vectors, neither is a scalar multiple of the other. But does it span? I hope intuitively we realize it doesn't. So these are non, this is an example, these two are non-examples of bases for R3. How would you verify that that, that does not uh, span R3? You would once again want to think about row operations, where your augmented matrix in this case would be three by three, and you'd have, you'd go ahead and pick an arbitrary vector over there for the third, for the third column. In all likelihood, you'd get an inconsistent system, and that would mean it would not span R3. I'm not going to show you the details. Or the following set. Now I've got four vectors in R3. 
As I said before, this can't possibly be linearly independent. It must be linearly dependent. If you set up an augmented matrix, three by five with the column of zeros on the right and did row operations, there would be a free variable. How about this one? Three vectors in R3. Here I did truly pick the numbers in these vectors somewhat randomly. I, I won't take the time to do it in Mathematica. I'm sure. I bet money, though I'm not a betting person. I bet money that these are linearly independent. If you made an augmented matrix with a bunch of zeros and did row operations, you would not get a row of zeros. If you got all leading ones, you'd get something like this. And you would not have any free variables. The corresponding homogeneous system would only have the trivial solution. Now, it's not what happened here with this example. So I'm going to go back to putting this a zero here. Not going to take the time to do it. You should take the time to do it. Check that it is a basis. Okay. It would be linearly independent. It would also span. If we have arbitrary right hand side for an arbitrary vector in R3, call the numbers, I don't know, y1, y2, y3, or something, or maybe u1, or maybe just abc, and do the row operations. Again, because you'd get a, in all likelihood a non zero number here, you'd be able to solve the system. You actually don't have to go all the way to reduce row echelon form to see that the system would be consistent. It's enough to just get leading ones in each row. More examples. The standard basis of PM is what? What's PM? That is the vector space of all polynomials of degree less than or equal to n. So the vectors are polynomials, which you can think of purely algebraically if you want, but of course we don't typically do that. We also graph polynomials, and you can graph them, but don't let the graphs mislead you. It's essentially the algebraic symbols that are the vectors. What would the standard basis be? I'm going to use t as the variable here before I used x. I will use t from now on. What would be the simplest basis? Well, every polynomial of degree n or less is, by definition essentially, a <clears throat> linear combination Say a n t to the n plus a n minus 1 t to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 etc. plus a 2 t squared plus a 1 t plus a 0. If this truly has degree n, then the a n would not be well, 0. If it had degree less than n, a n would be 0. But we'd be considering if it was a non zero polynomial, one of the other a's to be 0, and no higher power would be, would be present. It's a linear combination. Is that collection of those powers of t a basis? Yeah. And the a0, by the way, is the same as a0 times 1. These n plus 1 functions, 1 t, t squared through t to the n, do form a basis for pn. Certainly, they span. An arbitrary polynomial of degree less than or equal to n has this form. It is therefore a linear combination of those. I am writing them powers in ascending order here. I could, could have rearranged these to write these things in ascending order as well. That's our standard basis for Pn. The fact that there's n plus 1 of them means Pn is actually n plus 1 dimensional. R, any basis of R3 has three vectors. Any basis of Rn has n vectors. Pn ends up being n plus 1 dimensional because any basis has n plus 1 polynomials. How about this one for P2? Is that a basis for P2? Set of all polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2 where addition 
of polynomials and scalar multiplication is defined in the usual way. Are these, do they form a basis for P2? We'd have to check the conditions. Are they linearly independent and do they span? How would you decide? Let's first think about whether it spans. What do I have to do? Give me an arbitrary polynomial of degree less than or equal to 2, an element of P2, where A0, A1, and A2 are arbitrary. Question is, can we find weights, C1, C2, and C3, so that a linear combination of these three polynomials with these weights gives me in this arbitrary polynomial? Sounds like a hard question. But again, here's what it means. Look at the red line first. It can be solved. We can figure it out. Because we can write this linear combination in this form, if you think about it, compare with these three polynomials. The constant term comes from c1 times 1 plus c3 times negative 3, giving me c1 minus 3 negative. 3c3, c3 times negative 3. The t term comes from c1 times t plus c2 times 2t plus c3 times 5t, thus giving me c1 plus 2c2 plus 5c3. And the t squared term comes from, well, there's no t squared term there, c2 times t squared plus c3 times t squared, which is what you see there. Can I choose? C1, C2, C3 to make these three things equal a given A0, A1, and A2. You would, if you had particular numbers for A0, A1, and A2, put these in an augmented matrix. The corresponding system of equations that you'd have coefficients for the coefficient matrix 1, 0, negative 3, 1, 2, 5 for the second row, 0, 1, 1 for the third row, and you'd have A1, 0, A1, A2 in the right hand column. And you do row operations and see if it's consistent or not. We can actually do the row operations without making an augmented matrix. We can just look at the coefficient matrix. Notice 1, 0, negative 3 corresponds to this. 1, 2, 5 corresponds to this. 0, 1, 1 corresponds to this. I'm kind of imagining there being a last column representing A0, A1, and A2. But if we just do row operations, we can see that the system is going to be consistent. Why? Because if we just go to row echelon form, we get this. There's a 6 there. I can convert that to a 1 by multiplying the last row by 1 6, but I don't have to. We can stop right there because there is a pivot in every row. And even if I multiply row 3 by 1 6, there will still be a pivot position in every row. You don't want to multiply a row by 0. That would be bad. You want to multiply by non-zero numbers. And that would mean the corresponding system is consistent, because whatever happened with the A1, A2, and A3, as I continue to do row, row, row operations, it doesn't matter what happens to them, because I still have, ultimately, z equals something. I could back substitute to figure out y equals something, and then back substitute to figure out that x equals something. Or I should say c1, c2, and c3 equals something. The corresponding system is consistent. Also, there's a pivot in every column. The corresponding homogeneous system, where I have zeros in the last column, has no free variables. It has only the trivial solution. So this fact means that I've got spanning of P2 by this collection of three polynomials. And this other fact implies that um, it's linearly independent set of three polynomials. This implies linear independence. Interesting. We can think about polynomials and whether they form a basis or not by, by doing row operations still. Interesting. I wonder if that's an accident. No, it's not an accident. We can relate these things to our favorite vector space, Rn. Spanning and being linearly independent means the answer is yes, it is a basis. Okay? I didn't write that in the PowerPoint, but that is the answer. You may want to write it down. Yes, this collection of three polynomials is a basis for P2. It spans and is a linearly independent set. Let's relate this to differential equations. What would be a standard slash natural basis for the solution space of the second order 
linear homo homogeneous ODE, y double prime plus qy equals zero. Using primes here to save space, I also could have used Leibniz notation, the second derivative of y with respect to t twice. Hey, that's a harmonic oscillator equation, undamped. We've seen solutions to this before. Claim a basis for the solution space. The set of all solutions of the solution space is cosine of square root of qt, comma sine of square root of qt. And that is sort of the most standard slash natural basis. It's the simplest one, you might say. Any two functions that are linear combinations of these and not multiples of each other would also be a basis. But this is the simplest one. I should really say it. Well, okay, being standard or natural is a matter of opinion. I'm just calling this a basis. But in my opinion, and in many people's, it is sort of the most standard slash natural basis for this solution space. Certainly these functions are linearly independent. They're not scalar multiples of each other. Their graphs, if you want to think about graphs, are not vertical stretches of each other. But do they span the solution space? And wait a minute, is the solution space even a vector space? So that you could even talk about a basis for it. Actually, we already know the answer to the second question. Let me hint at it again, talk about it more later. The second order ODE, the left-hand side, defines a linear operator on a function space. It's a linear transformation on a function space. We're trying to figure out all the functions in the function space that get mapped to the zero function. It's the kernel of the linear transformation. And we know kernels, being subspaces of a bigger vector space, are also vector spaces themselves. So yes, it is a vector space. Do these span? That takes a theorem that we haven't written down yet. It, it does. These, these do span. It's related to the fact that this differential equation is linear and second order to say that it also spans. But it's a theorem that we just haven't gotten to yet. Um, uh, we're getting low on time here. I didn't want to spend so long on that. Uh, I, I did this example in lecture 18 or 17b, the null space and column space of a matrix, the matrix being the matrix A here. The B matrix is its reduced row echelon form. <clears throat> um, I'll let you think about this or watch lecture 17b, but let me just add one extra comment here just to emphasize the key process. The vectors created from the free variables, these two vectors were created from the free variables that occurred that were x3 and x5, form a basis for the null space of A. And the pivot columns of the original matrix form a basis for the column space. The pivot columns correspond to pivots. They are in rows one, two, and four in the reduced row echelon form. Columns, or I meant columns one, two, and four. Columns one, two, and four A are what you see here, and they do form a basis for the column space. So I'm just adding that extra remark in there. All right, a couple more slides. Very important, though. Coordinate vectors and coordinate systems. Now we're starting to get again to this idea of changing variables, changing coordinates. That will be our main application of differential equations. Something called the unique representation theorem. Let B be the set of vectors B1 through Bn. And suppose it's a basis for the vector space V, which could be a subspace of some bigger space. For each vector x in V, this theorem says there exists unique scalars, C1 through Cn, such that x is the linear combination of the B vectors with the C scalars as the weights. Okay. Got a basis for a vector space, got a vector in that vector space, there exist unique scalars such that that vector is a linear combination of the basis vectors. The existence of the scalars comes from the spanning, and the uniqueness of the scalars comes from the linear independence of the basis vectors. Definition. If we consider this basis to be an ordered basis, emphasis on the word order now, in other words, not just a set, but also ordered 
using the subscripts. I'm saying B1 comes before B2 comes before B3, etc. Not that I'm saying B1 is less than B2 is less than B3. I mean it's just coming in order in this list. I just picked an order. I could have picked a different order. Then the weights C1 through CN, CN in this theorem above, the unique representation theorem, are called the coordinates of X relative to the ordered basis B. And we write this. X square brackets sub B is this column vector in Rn. And that's no accident. X itself, in the theory, is just an arbitrary vector in an arbitrary abstract vector space. But I'm saying if this vector space has, is, has a basis with n elements, and if I decide to order them in some order, and call it an ordered basis, and again, I could have picked a different order, it would be the same basis, but a different ordered basis if I do that. Then this theorem says there are the, the C's that make this linear combination true, and they're unique, and I can define something called the coordinate vector of x relative to the ordered basis to be this vector in Rn, an n-dimensional vector. The square brackets just emphasizes that I'm now going to think of this as a column vector. The subscript of the B emphasizes what the ordered basis is. So the last slide here, we're just going to summarize some things now. We'll look at examples in the next lecture, 19b. What's the goal here? The goal of introducing the ideas of coordinate vectors and coordinate systems is twofold. First of all, it's going to help us deal with unfamiliar vector spaces by relating them to the familiar Rn. Which makes sense because these coordinate vectors are in Rn. Secondly, it helps us define coordinate changes in Rn. And this is related to our main goal in using linear algebra to understand differential equations and difference equations for that matter. Remember the biggie from lectures one and two? The biggie application of linear to differential equations is linear transformations represent changes of coordinates to facilitate calculations and understanding of linear systems, especially changes of coordinates defined by special vectors that are called eigenvectors. Not saying yet what eigenvectors are, but they will form a special kind of basis for a given linear system of differential equations or difference equations. And those special vectors will help you solve the systems and help you think about them geometrically in terms of a change of coordinates. Um, I'm not going to go through this example in detail because of the time, but let me just say it should make some sense as you read through it and think about it on your own. And let me also say it's related to a picture that I got Mathematica to draw related to a slanted skewed coordinate system where the first axis is the same as before, called the u-axis. And the second one is slanted, though not slanted at a 45 degree angle, it's slanted about like this. I'm trying to write j hat, 0, 1, this vector, so to speak, as a linear combination of b1, this unit vector, and b2, this other vector that looks about like this, that's not unit length right here. Um, and it's not perpendicular to B1. It's not orthogonal to it. This is going to define a skewed coordinate system. And the purpose of trying to solve this question, to find the coordinate vector of this one with respect to this ordered basis, to get this answer, is to realize how to write this vector as a linear combination of these two, and how to write it in the new skewed coordinate system the calculations also involve an inverse matrix. Um, 
I'll say more about this next time, but this two by two matrix here, one, two, zero, three, its inverse matrix can be found by a shortcut formula that I haven't mentioned yet, though it was in the reading in my blog, infinityisreallybig.com. Um, shortcut for finding inverses of two by two matrices is the idea there. And this code right here is just a way to visualize this. The purple vector is the x. These two black vectors are v1 and v2. The red and blue vectors are linear combinations of the b1 and b2, the weights of which give me the coordinates of the purple vector in this new coordinate system that would be defined by these two vectors here. It would be slanted. You don't see the slanted, you don't see the slanted grid. I didn't take the time to make that there, but um, if you think about that example carefully, hopefully that will facilitate understanding and we'll do more examples in lecture 19b. Thanks for watching.